tonight is the time of celebration for Rivercrest and for the Hudson School District. I'm Mary Bowen Agabratton, the superintendent of the Hudson School District. Tonight, we're here to receive the Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design Award from the U.S. Green Building Council. In recognition and independent expert confirmation that Rivercrest Elementary has been designed and constructed as a sustainable elementary school at the gold standard level. I think back to how this all began. It began with the facilities task force that those of you in the community will remember and a recommendation that they made to build additional space for learning. And then the Board of Education certainly came through with the leadership that we needed to endorse a referendum for this new elementary school. The board was led by President Dan Chernohoy. Dan, will you stand up, please? And Vice President Dick Minnick. Dick? Thank you to both of you. The plan was to design a highly, high quality community learning center and an environmentally friendly school as a model for our children and for our community. Some said it couldn't be done. And others said that it would cost too much. And yet, Rivercrest was built at $57 per square foot below the average for an elementary new construction in three different states, Illinois, Minnesota, and Wisconsin. Low construction cost, low operating cost, and green. You just can't beat that combination. And that's how Dick Minnick over there termed it as a wow. I want to recognize our district design and construction team who worked with Hoffman on this project. Certainly Dick Minnick. And Dick, would you stand and stay standing, please? Tim Erickson, our Director of Financial Services. Tim? Jim Stasekel, who is in charge of facilities and grounds. Jim? He had to leave. And he was also our owner's representative on site. Pat Hodges, who is principal of Rivercrest, and myself. And thank you very much to that team. What we envisioned for Rivercrest came to pass. And although the Rivercrest project progressed very smoothly, the building doesn't become a school until the first staff and students move in. So I'd like the Rivercrest staff, those that are here this evening, to stand up. Please stand. Stay standing. Oh, they're back there. That's why they're all waving at us. They are standing. So that we can recognize them for their work to open Rivercrest and make it a school that continues to be focused on earth-friendly learning and practices. Thank you very much. And since Rivercrest is first and foremost for our students, it is fitting that this evening's program begins with words from our students. Principal Pat Hodges is here to introduce the video. When we were talking about the ceremony for tonight, um, we talked about what students we would have speak. And, that, and that's a hard thing to decide. And I was speaking to my counselor, and she reminded me that Hoffman had come out, the marketing department, and had done um, interviews with our students. And I looked at the video and thought, wow, this is perfect. They did just a wonderful job. And you're going to see how much our kids know about our building and just the importance of it to them. So with that. Thank you. 
represent the other 500 plus students that are in the school and students who will be coming in the future who are learning about green practices and as I hear from parents they're taking those home and saying you know we need to turn the lights off when we leave uh, this room so we're hearing a lot about how that is continuing on outside of Rivercrest into the homes as well just before we move on I want to recognize some other students Certainly the students in our high school beginning chef class provided the refreshments this evening and the music that was provided by our middle school and high school orchestra students. So join me in thanking them. I don't believe any of them stayed, so we will pass that on that you appreciate um, their work. At this time, I'd like to welcome Mark Hansen from Hoffman LLC to present the award uh, to Dan Chernohoy, Board of Education President. President. And um, Mark is the Director of Sustainable Design for Hoffman, and he represents a team, a uh, Hoffman team. And I'd like the Hoffman team to stand up. Mark may be introducing you later, but I'd like you to stand up at this time. The Hoffman team. The Hoffman team was our partner in this endeavor, endeavor. And one of the reasons we selected this team as architect and construction manager was for their ex expertise in green design and construction. And we definitely learned from them through this process. They pushed us and um, challenged us, and we benefited from their expertise and we, throughout this project. And we look this evening and celebrate the effort and the work that they have helped us accomplish. accomplish. Mark? And you might as well come up. And, uh, often, a few of our often team members are here with us, so I'm going to ask them to come up, too. Uh, Mary, thanks so much for those, uh, those kind words. And uh, uh, I can certainly say that this is a great privilege to, uh, to be here tonight. Um, what really excites me among many things is I can see that we have some up and coming professionals at the school. And then we need to be back to the school district in about six or seven more years and do some serious recruiting. So. We have with us tonight just a, uh, a few of our team members. It would be uh, great to have them all here, but uh, with the various preparing responsibilities and everything else, here is a, a small sampler of, of, of some of our team from Hoffman. Rivercrest is a very, very special place. It is, uh, I don't think you quite know yet how special it is, but it's um, it's something that has uh, already gained national recognition, and it's going to be getting more national recognition. Hoffman feels very, um, we get a chance to work on a lot of different types of, of buildings. And um, some are schools, some are office buildings, some are uh, retirement um, uh, buildings, and so on. 
but it's particularly uh, rewarding and exciting for us to work with schools because the match to our mission is, is, is so good. Mary shared with you a few things that are so special about the school. And uh, I'll, I'll just add a, a, a couple more, but one of them is uh, every year professionals around the United States gather at a national meeting called Greenbelt. And at that national conference last year, we were there and uh, we talked a little bit at there's a schools, uh, a, uh, a, a schools committee representing all 50 states. And um, as chair of the Wisconsin um, Schools Committee uh, for Green Schools, I was there and I, I hinted at what was coming at Rivercrest. But we didn't have our certification. We were confident that gold was going to be achievable. But you, you can't speak of it too uh, specifically before you have it. And we also thought or knew that it would be at a very good cost point. We'd certainly meet your budget. Know where that was going to come out. Well, this year when I go back to the national conference in a month from now in Phoenix, we'll be able to talk about Rivercrest as the second school in the United States, elementary school, public elementary school in the United States that has achieved a lead for schools. It's a, that's a new rating system in lead, the lead for schools gold level. It's the second one in the United States. And it makes it also. First one in Wisconsin at any rating to be a lead for school certified school. And so you're really breaking new ground. And as the word gets out that you are $57 per square foot below the regional cost average, which you just heard, or if you like percentages, if uh, you're in common, perhaps 29% below the regional cost average for new elementary schools completed. In States Mary mentioned in 2008, it is, a, it is just something that is so remarkable. To get there, I think it needed three C's. One C was conviction. We were convicted that this was the right thing to do. And second C is collaboration. And collaboration with the whole school team. I mean, everything from the board to the administration to the principal. To the teachers, it is, uh, to the facilities people, it's just been a wonderful collaboration. And it's now spread that collaboration to the community. Couldn't be more pleased with that. And then we have the collaboration from our all the subcontractors and, and some material suppliers. And of course, one that has been very special to us to do with Anderson Windows because we had a certain challenge of the performance we wanted. I think it was. Uh, Aaron Hawk was the name, you mentioned the windows, and you're your student. He liked the big windows and the views. Well, that is exactly what we, we wanted. And, um, and we worked with Anderson on a new window that you have here, and we now are putting in uh, another five projects around because of work that was done in collaboration with Anderson. So that is the, the kind of collaboration that it takes to pull us off. And finally, it, it, it takes uh, um, some courage. There are those times you are you on the right path here? Is this the right thing? Is it worth that extra money to do the certification, even though it is within your budget? Is you know all those things that you you have the courage to carry out your convictions. Yeah. And uh, so now there's not much left to be said, except um, we have one more step. And that is now that we have this great learning tool that is an ongoing living laboratory, perhaps only halfway there, we now have to make this work in the lives of our students and uh, make this an ongoing living lab in green education and green living. And uh, I'm sure you're up to the challenge. And uh, we're certainly going to be there with you as we watch the school perform as we go into the future. So I want to present the U.S. Green Building Council lead gold plaque for Rivercrest School.
just have a, a picture to go on the wall of the school that commemorates this event, the official letter, a picture of the school, and congratulations from Hoffman and the U.S. Federal Council. Congratulations. Uh, um, all over the world, and they're all very important projects 
Uh, many of them are high profile. They range in size and complexity. But every once in a while, you come across a project that is truly special. And from the very beginning, Rivercrest has been one of those very special projects for us. Not only because it's in our backyard and part of our community, um, but from our very first meeting and talking to Mary and Dan and the folks from Hoffman and, and all of the folks who are so deeply involved in this project, everyone aspired to build a school that was truly different and better uh, than what everyone else was building. And uh, not only was the vision there to do it, but the courage and resolve to see it through, recognizing that these projects are under a lot of scrutiny, there are a lot of challenges, but to build a school that was truly special. And I think tonight's kind of a culmination of that um, as we realize that uh, with the recognition that Rivercrest has received. You know, from our standpoint, this was not an easy project. We went in kind of thinking it was going to be an easy project, but it became very clear that if, if we were going to do our part in contributing to what it was going to take to achieve this kind of legal recognition, we were have, going to have to go beyond kind of our standard off-the-shelf uh, product offering. And uh, we actually designed a very customized window for this. All of the wood in these 502 windows comes from forests to forests that use sustainable forestry practices that are certified by the Forest Stewardship Council. All of the glass in this building was customized both to meet the energy requirements, but also to provide the shading and the tinting to enhance the learning environment in the classroom. And I think, you know, as a result of uh, working with Hoffman and working with the school board, we figured it out, and along the way, I think it made us a better company. Um, we had an opportunity to stretch our do selves and do things we didn't think we were capable of doing. We developed some wonderful relationships with companies like Hoffman. We're together now. We're doing some real innovative things all across the country. I think we forged a great relationship with the school board. We got more deeply involved in terms of working with our foundation to provide some of the funding to build the underpass so we could create the connection between the YMCA park and the school, which was part of the original vision in terms of creating a total learning experience. And, uh, you know, I think in all of those things together just made it a very, very special experience uh, uh, for all of us. So the other thing that for me, quite frankly, that will always stand out is when it is in your backyard and it is part of your community. And I've lived here in Hudson now for 15 years. I've raised my children here. My wife's been a lifelong member of this community. It's always kind of special when you can participate in something where you feel like you're truly making this community a better place for everyone to live. And I think Rivercrest has achieved that. And so a big congratulations to all of you for what you've been able to accomplish. Thank you. We'd also like to thank the City of Hudson for working with us, starting with annexation, moving through construction, through building inspections, and certainly now with public service support. And the City of Hudson Mayor, Dean Knutson. Well, congratulations, Dan, and all the members of the Board of Education, and to Superintendent Bowen Agabratton and all the administration team, I think you've done something pretty special. You should be proud of what you've accomplished in doing it. What I like about Rivercrest, you set a goal, you know, you had a construction cost goal, I think you met that goal, and to be under that average cost is pretty phenomenal. Something you deserve a big round of applause for, I think. So that's it. state for this type of thing, working with, you know, the great window vendor, window manufacturer, but they've actually come along and probably reached a different level because of working in this partnership. That's an example of leadership. I think that everyone in the community has already learned some things. I can certainly say I've learned some things by watching what went on. Uh, the reuse and recycling of construction waste 
is such a simple common sense concept that you know that on most construction sites there's simply big dumpsters and everything is going in there. And here it wasn't done that way and that just makes a lot of sense. I mean, you, you can see that, hey, here's a learning thing. So leaders have to have followers and I think you gained a lot of followers by taking the lead and showing that something can be done in a cost-effective way. It's good for the environment and it makes a lot of economic sense. The one that affects the city of Hudson probably more than any other is the water usage. We provide your water, we treat your water, we chlorinate it, there's fluoride in there, we take out the iron and manganese, we do all of that. Once you're done with it, becomes ours again, we treat it and process it again. And of course you get charged for that, but not too long ago we built a five million dollar new well and treatment plant and just this year we were on the cusp of building another one. And we decided to take a step back from that and look at our entire rate structure. We've got a very old fashioned 1950s style rate structure where the more water you use, what happens? The less you pay. And now there's a kind of a new thing of conservation rate structure where it isn't that way. If you use sort of a limited amount of water, you get it at a very inexpensive rate. And we're going to start looking at that. We decided to wait and hold off on that because when you see what you've done here, I don't know the numbers, is a 20% reduction, something of that sort in your water usage over what it typically would be? 40. Okay, 40%. And that's huge. One of the things that drives our need for wells and treatment and so on in the city is lawn irrigation. And there have got to be better ways to do that than what currently is being done. So I'm hoping I've learned something. I know that the students here are learning. What a fantastic opportunity for them to learn as they're learning the rest of their schoolwork to learn about some other environmental principles, energy efficiency principles, and so on. So congratulations to you. Should be proud. We focused on our students early in the program, so we're going to, I think it's appropriate to end our ceremony this evening with our fifth grade students. Um, our fifth grade teacher, one of our fifth grade teachers, John Mueller, actually created our school song. John is a very talented musician and writer, and his fifth grade class last year created the song with John, and so they're going to sing that song, and I believe we're invited to participate. All right. That's your cue. <laughs> As I tell my students often, as writers we often get ideas for our writing at very unexpected times. And this song we wrote last year, and it was one of those times where I had been thinking about, well, oh, maybe we should get a, a school song or something. And at about 2 o'clock in the morning, I was awoken by these ideas that started going through my head. And so the next day I came to school and explained to my students I've got these things here that you need to help me with. And so we spent a couple of days kind of brainstorming different ways to put the words together and different ideas that we might be able to add to the thoughts that I have. And so we ended up with this song. And we call it Light of a Brand New Day. <laughs>
see the chorus is going to be sung several times during this time. And towards the end, we're hoping that you've learned it. And that you're going to start singing with us. Like a river. Thank you for understanding. Okay, certainly, Mary. Thank you. 
Again, uh, the agenda is in front of you. I'll entertain a motion for approval of the agenda. Mr. President, I move approval of the agenda as presented. We have a motion by Mark. Second. Second by Brian. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion's approved. We'll move on then to the student staff recognition, high school musical Beauty and the Beast. Sandy? Thank you. This evening we have with us Carrie Heisler, music director at the high school at Max Melanity. They are busy right now rehearsing the high school musical this fall will be Beauty and the Beast. And we'll let Carrie give us some of the details. Thank you for inviting us tonight. We're happy to be here. Um, I'm one of the directors, along with Andy Hayes, who's the director, and Denise Victor is a choreographer. And we'd like to invite you all to see the show on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, November 13, 14, 15, 20, 21st, 22nd. We have our regular Friday, Saturday night show as well as Sunday matinee. And this year we added the Saturday matinee to be such a popular family show, and especially on the children, so matinee times would be popular. We have uh, $10 for adults, $5 for students, and any district employee can get a $5 ticket as well if they have their ID when they come to get tickets. And tickets will on sale this Monday. So we hope that you can all see this year's production and um, see the wonderful work our high school students are doing. Um, Max is going to sing for you. He's playing a part of Beast. Um, he doesn't look like it's night, I know. His costume is already, but just imagine him um, on stage doing that. And he's actually was out sick today. Our bell went home sick, um, but he agreed to come and sing anyway. So it's under the weather. He's going to sing just the first part of one of his songs um, for you. It's one of the big numbers that ends the first act. It's called If I Can't Love Her. The slightest trace of anything that even hints at kindness, and from my tortured shame, no comfort, no escape. I see deep within this utter blindness. Hopeless as my dream dies, as the time flies, love a lost illusion, helpless, unforgiven, cold and driven to this sad conclusion. No beauty could move me, no goodness can prove me, no power on earth if I can't love her, no hope she would do so, no dream to pursue, so I finally know that I will always be in this hopeless state and condemned to wait, wait for death to set me free. things when he's healthy. <laughs> uh, tickets go on sale on Monday. We're looking at Friday, November 12th. Um, I have the 12, 14, no, 12, 13, 14, 15, 21st, 22nd, I think is what I'm recalling as far as dates. If I drive that right here. Thank you. The next recognition this evening, we're going to ask Betsy May to come forward. I want you to take note of her outfit here. 
Betsy attended Space Camp. We are very fortunate in Hudson. This is the second teacher who has uh, attended Space Camp. And Betsy earned what is called the Right Stuff Award. And that award comes from being a leader, a team player, being enthusiastic, which she gets with a capital E, curious, a full participant, an example of someone who wants to learn more. Those are some of the things they looked for during the camp. And Betsy came out with the Right Stuff Award. Congratulations. <laughs> Betsy, can you just talk a little bit about your experience, please? Okay, great. Um, Beauty and the Beast is kind of a hard act to follow. Maybe I should have put it on a zip line or something. But <laughs> Um, I am very honored to be recognized by the board um, and also to have been one of three teachers from Wisconsin chosen to have the honor to go to space camp. Um, it was just an incredible experience. And um, what Mark Hoffman was talking about in terms of collaboration is the biggest lesson I turned, took back from space camp experience that um, whether we were learning about the mission scientists and all the missions that we had to participate in, um, it took people from all disciplines to collaborate together. And um, I'm so glad that that's a, also an initiative of our district is to work on collaboration with our students and their staff. Um, the other lesson I learned about was um, scientific inquiry. All the activities that we did were based on scientific inquiry, um, trying to see what worked and what didn't work, and then going on from there. So I really learned some valuable experiences from it. Um, as a part of the Right Stuff Award, um, I also won a scholarship for a student from Hudson School District to go to space camp for a um, free week. Um, so I will be choosing the student soon to do that. So, thank you. Betsy, could you come back up here for a certificate? Um, we have a certificate that reads. Uh, a certificate of excellence presented to Betsy May, an acknowledgement and recognition of your outstanding achievement. Thank you very much. Superintendent's report. All right. Good evening. We have a lot of good news to share in addition to the um, celebration we had this evening about the Lead Gold Award for Rivercrest. And first, we're going to start off with the middle school. We have, we're so pleased to receive a letter from the Association of Wisconsin School Administrators that have identified Hudson Middle School as an exemplary middle school. And the reason they have identified uh, the middle school, we already knew it was exemplary, but uh, we were glad an outside source has also acknowledged that. The middle school's math scores are in the top 10% of those uh, scores throughout the state of all middle schools. And in fact, just to share a little bit of additional information, we received um, a report that has information from all of the schools in the state and their scores. And we look when we look at Hudson Middle School and we look at all of the scores for eighth graders in reading, language, arts, math, science, and social studies. Hudson Middle School scores in the is the top 37 out of 561 schools in the state with eighth graders. And that's quite, that's a huge accomplishment. That's in the 93rd uh, point four percentile. And also, if we look at those schools that happen to be just a little fraction ahead of Hudson Middle School, all the way up to those that are at 99 percentile, there are no other middle schools or eighth graders, eighth grade class, that have 359 students who took the WKC. In fact, they're ahead of Hudson Middle School. There are only four other schools who have 250 students or more. And so when I look at this list, the top one has six eighth graders. 
The next one has 11 eighth graders. The next one has 43 and 28 and 11 and 19. So what an accomplishment for Hudson Middle School, for Dan Koch and his staff for um, ha having this kind of achievement that we're all working forward to. It's not only the middle school, the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade uh, teachers and support staff and administrators that we congratulate, but we also congratulate our elementary uh, staff because um, the middle school does this because of the work they do, but it comes all the way through the system and a systems approach, and you can see this in action, and this kind of recognition is great for us to have. So, Dan, will you come forward? And now I'll move on to additional recognition that the district is receiving. You know that um, you know, our work in improvement and innovation continues, and it's a continual improvement process in our system. Um, we were recruited to by Wisconsin uh, School Boards Association to write an article that you've seen in the October uh, school news issue um, entitled Paving a New Path, Hudson School District Develops a Framework for the 21st Century, and that was about our HSD 2025 vision. We've also, um, in the October 2009 issue of Wisconsin uh, Teaching Today, I'm sorry, the September issue, we have three articles about the district, and so we're continuing to be recognized throughout the state as a leader. Uh, we have three presentations coming up in state conferences or conventions that I just want to highlight. Uh, the first one is at the 2010, the January Wisconsin State Education Convention that we hope some of you will be attending. And uh, that presentation is entitled Learning from Global Neighbors, Thailand, Wisconsin International Sunrise Program. Certainly it supports our global literacy. Um, it highlights our global vision and the culture we're developing in the district that comes from HSD 2025. And uh, we are doing this in collaboration with the Department of Public Instruction because of their support for the work that we're doing. Um, another one that we are presenting at the State Education Convention is a catalyst for change, transforming the uh, district. And that is really the Rivercrest story that we heard this evening. Um, there was evidence that uh, we built this school to be sustainable, but we heard uh, stories tonight that extended throughout the district um, in sustainability and also into our community. Um, we have, uh, we look at uh, friendly, uh, earth-friendly practices, and uh, Dan, you talked about those as well, and expanding uh, throughout our district. We have our uh, R3 committee, which is reduce, reuse, recycling. We are working on energy conservation, and we have results that show success there. And we have, have numerous places throughout the district that we have staff committed to um, conserving and reducing our um, consumption. So uh, kudos to everyone for that. And we'll be telling that story along with Hoffman at the School Board Convention. And lastly, at the 2010 Wisconsin Promise Conference, uh, Peg Shoemaker and Susie Prather and a literacy coach will be um, sharing information about our new elementary schedule. And you'll remember that that schedule has been implemented this year without any additional cost to the district. It inclu includes um, a guaranteed literacy time for all um, K through 5 classes, an intervention block to help students and support their learning, and then collaborative time for all of our grade level teachers. Um, and again, I just point out that no additional cost, that's quite an accomplishment and one for us to um, share with other districts. And so I appreciate Peg and Susie and the literacy coach doing that. So kudos to everyone who is working to improve our practices and to innovate in that school district. Moving right along to the uh, Hudson High School Chamber Choir. And again, we have recognition um, about their success and their uh, achievement. They have been invited to perform at the 2010 Wisconsin Choral Directors Convention. This is quite an honor. It's in January. Um, many, many uh, 
requires submit audition recordings. And um, directors throughout the state, certainly talented directors throughout the state, pick only the very best of choirs and have that privilege of performing for choir directors. And in the letter that we received from the Wisconsin Choral Directors Association, I just want to read this quote because it's it's a wonderful um, statement about our program. Mr. Andrew Hayes and his singers are committed to excellence by the quality of the repertoire chosen and the vocal and musical excellence we heard on their audition recording. A choral program of this quality does not happen in a vacuum, but is the result of a committed commitment to excellence by the administration, staff, students, and parents of your school community. So I certainly thank the board um, and their commitment, uh, our community and our staff, for um, producing this kind of quality in our choir and having them perform for others and sharing their talents. I just keep moving along, so if you have any questions, feel free. But I those wonderful things that are happening and ways that the district is being recognized. Now we're moving on, I believe, to third Friday in September enrollments. And you have a document in front of you that is really our official document as we work on um, the numbers. And I'm going to summarize it, but really not speak directly from that document. Um, I looked at our growth um, in comparison to uh, years ago. And in five years, over time, our early childhood through 12 growth, and these are district resident students, do not include um, a number of, of groups like open enrolled students. So district resident students, we've had 623 additional students in five years. Certainly that's beyond the size of the school that we've added. And uh, as I talk more about um, space, we will uh, see the impact on space. At elementary, we've gained from last year's official count, and this is based on the third Friday official count in September, um, we have gained 53 students, so K through 5. Middle school, 46. At high school, we've basically stayed the same, but gone down um, five students uh, for calculations. But the district total from last year is 94 additional students. You remember that we um, had some growth last year, but uh, that had been quite reduced, and now we are gaining again, um, and that growth rate is starting to escalate. Um, again, even during the recession that we're experiencing. I believe that people are continuing to come to our community because the quality of the schools, the quality of education, um, the educational excellence that we've seen, we've seen, we've seen um, many representations of that. If I look at the elementary schools, we have three schools that have growth this year. Uh, Willow River, um, Rock, EP Rock, and Hudson Prairie. Now, we would also expect that Rivercrest would have growth, but because of the action that you took to change the adjust the boundaries, that um, growth has really uh, been shifted to rock at the present time, but we do expect that Rivercrest will pick up in the future. When we look at the middle school um, and capacity of the middle school, I'm going to talk about that in just a minute, but just um, at one point. We are now 86 students over capacity and um, continuing to be concerned about that, so we'll have to talk more about that in a minute. At the high school, although we have uh, basically stayed the same or five less students, if we look at um, incoming classes, ninth grade and 10th grade, they have increases in enrollment. So we have 16 additional students in ninth grade and 15 additional students in 10th uh, grade. And as we add more students from the middle school that's growing and from the elementary schools, we're going to see that growth move into the high school. Um, and then we'll be out of space as well. I looked at our numbers in comparison to Hazel Reinhardt projections from 2008. And um, last year, we were off in those projections. She was quite a bit higher than we are. But we are um, making up ground at the present time. At the elementary, our actual enrollment is 25 students less than her projection. Um, that, in the world of statistics, that's not real significant. And then at the middle school, we're 10 students left, less. That's really just right on. And then at the high school, we are 15 students less. 
Now, again, she, we are gaining on her um, enrollment projections, and uh, that is concerning as we think about space for our learning for our, our students in the future, um, but we are continuing to grow, and we're specifically looking at our district resident enrollment and what's happening to that. In open enrollment this year, we have, um, this is a change, we have 13 students more that have left us than coming in. And that's really um, as a result of virtual education, online learning. Um, those schools are continuing to develop across the state. And I know Sandy and Ed um, are looking at uh, that to increase that. We've talked about it at Learning and Program Development, and we will continue to, to develop our own program in that area. If you have any questions on enrollment, I'd be happy to answer those before we move on to the middle school. All right. Middle school. I said a few minutes ago, Hudson Middle School is beyond capacity. Um, we have an increase of 46 students and increasing that um, over the capacity by 86 students. So we are continuing to experience growth at the middle school as the elementary students move through. Um, when we look at the chart that you have in front of you, I just wanted to look at projections in a few different ways um, to compare them. And so I looked at Dr. Hazel Reinhardt's projection, and although I wouldn't call it um, uh, liberal, it, I just used it as um, an estimate and to see where we were in relationship to that with some more conservative estimates or projections. So in her projection, uh, which I just talked about, um, again, we're almost right on the mark with her projection. And if we look at that in four years at the middle school, assuming that her projections um, would continue uh, to be on the mark, we would be 282 seats beyond capacity at the middle school. And I know uh, Principal Dan Koch and his staff are, are very concerned about that. Uh, the, um, the board uh, has developed a goal for our short-term planning, and we're starting to work on that. And we'll talk more about that at the next meeting. Some people have um, not... Um, believe Dr. Reinhardt's growth projections, although they've been pretty true for us. So I looked at them in two other ways and just used some other figures um, that were more conservative just as another look to see what would happen. So the next uh, graph or chart, scenario B, is a little more conservative than hers. And what I did here was I took um, the increase that we had this year of middle school students, and that's 46 students, and I just took the base year, um, this year's current enrollment, and added 46 for the next four years. And what happens with that, we are 270 students over capacity in four years, very close to Hazel's, but just a little bit down. Again, very significant growth, and growth we need to be concerned about when we're, these are all growth figures over capacity. Uh, I took one more look at this, and this is the most conservative projection, and what I did was I took the average growth from fifth grade to sixth grade over the last three years, and that was 21 students. And then I took the preceding fifth grade's numbers, kind of a complicated um, a description, and took elementary enrollment and just moved it forward with no growth. No growth. And so the only thing that, that grows in this is the 21 additional students each year. And you can see, even with the low growth of 21 students, no growth at elementary, no growth at elementary, we end up with over capacity in four years of 202 students. Again, that's the most conservative look. Um, we have no history that would tell us that we would be that conservative in growth, but I was just looking at it in um, different ways and saying no matter what happens, we're going to ha be in great need for space. So uh, our district goal to find a short-term solution, we're looking at a three to four year plan at the present time to um, bring back to you, and you'll, we'll be starting on information next meeting uh, about that. 
and uh, just a, a really very important need that we have. You know, some people in our community um, will talk about the need for a new high school or um, remodeled space at the high school or, or thinking that we only have um, a problem with space for learning at high school. And yes, we have that too. But our immediate need is at the middle school. And it is very significant. And we need to have our community understand that um, the need is first at the middle school, and then it will move on to the high school. Any questions that we have about that? Right, then I'll move on to um, a China Hudson Global connection. As you know, global literacy, um, we are starting with an implementation priority and a district goal um, of that for coming from HSD 2025, providing opportunities for student and staff to pursue international travel and exchanges is certainly one of the um, action plans of our graduate learner outcome in global, global literacy. And we have a belief statement that says all students and staff need global connections and experiences. You know, our high school staff right now is um, taking advantage of those global connections and starting with um, a social studies trip to Paris this year for students and a choir trip to the Czech Republic and East Central Europe. Um, I heard, I'm not sure if the number is exactly correct, but I heard a little less than 100 students are interested in that choir trip. So, you know, we have a lot of students taking advantage of these international experiences. We had one last year as well. And certainly that's a great experience for our students. The state of Wisconsin has established a partnership with the province of Heilongjiang, China. And they are sister states. And they have cooperated for a number of years in commerce, agriculture, and um, they have, um, I have been selected as a Wisconsin ambassador to participate in the Heilongjiang Wisconsin Administrator Shadowing Project, along with seven other Wisconsin superintendents and four Wisconsin principals. This um, shadowing project is sponsored by the Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction and endorsed by the state superintendent, the Wisconsin Association of School District Administrators, and the Association of Wisconsin School Administrators, along with the uh, National China Exchange Initiative and the Ministry of Education in Beijing. This um, program pairs a public school administrator from Wisconsin with their counterpart in Heilongjiang, China. And I have been paired with Mr. Zhao, who is the vice principal of Harbron No. 6 Senior High School. And um, Mr. Zhao will be here in, in Hudson and in our schools November 14th through 16th. He will stay with me and he will shadow me and he will spend some time at the high school as well. And then I will travel to China uh, taking some um, professional development through the Ministry of Education in Beijing and then moving on to his school in Harbron, Heilongjiang. Uh, the purpose of this is for us to establish an ongoing relationship with um, Harbor Number no. Six High School and establish a relationship and communication and knowledge sharing between Hudson High School and our other schools and the Long John students and staff. Um, I look forward to communication exchanges, two-way student travel exchanges, and joint learning uh, projects. I hope that we will be able to establish um, an ongoing exchange where we have Chinese students who come here one year and the following year, year we have students that go to China and that continues on. Um, also look to increase Hudson student interest and understanding of China and global literacy while engaging them through the time that I'm going to be in China. And um, since uh, China is known for its science and math instruction, I will be looking at those instructional practices and see what we can do. I will be reporting the findings um, and the things that I learn in China about their program to the district's high school of the future research study team that you know is a district goal. 
So just a little bit about Halongjiang province, province and Harbin, because um, this is the area that we would, I hope in the future, be sending students. Halongjiang province is in the northeast part of China. It's actually the most northeast part of China. It has 30 million people, and it's the capital city. Um, Harbin is referred to as the Ice City because it's very cold. It's just next to Siberia. It's also referred to as the Oriental Moscow or the Oriental Paris because it is a mix of Western and Chinese cultures. So a very, very interesting place and very different from what our students have experienced. So I, I'm looking forward to this kind of experience for our students. It's the biggest city in Northeast China, and it's one of the most important industrial cities in China. Um, it's the country's largest capital city. It is a front runner in auto manufacturing, food production, medicine, and research, to name a few. And it has a very advanced transportation network. They have five um, railroads that go through the city and move people about. So it's um, a great place for our students um, and staff to uh, have this kind of exchange in the future. Just telling you a little bit about um, preparation activities when Mr. Zhao comes here. We'll have a welcome reception. Um, we're planning for a tour of district buildings and operations, dialogue with high school staff, classroom visits, um, visits with the Global Literacy Curriculum Committee that Sandy is leading, um, and the professional staff development team, um, community introductions in Rotary and the Chamber of Commerce Leadership Hudson. Um, he will attend the high school's production of Beauty and the Beast. Uh, we'll have lunch with the Mandarin language students that we've also initiated this year. And there will be a tour of the Hudson Community and Twin Cities. Now that's very short. The, his days will be full uh, while he is here and um, once you have the opportunity to meet him. For my visit to China, we're really in the preparation stages right now. Um, I have just sent out an email to all of our, our staff um, introducing this trip or this exchange. And um, I have sent out dates in November for staff to come to volunteer meetings to plan activities while I'm gone. And we're looking at um, helping the, the using technology, helping our students engage in this China experience. It could be things like um, Chinese geography, culture, education, and points of interest to the students during that time. We're going to assign each school um, a period of time to communicate with me while I'm there, and students will be able to post questions. Um, I'll provide a report to you when we come back, and um, we'll be planning for future student and staff connections and exchanges with the uh, high school. Um, I'm really looking forward to those meetings with teachers at elementary, middle school, and the high school level to see what they would like and how they would like to make connections and how we can do that during my trip because it's very important to me that we engage students in this experience and we pique their interest in international um, experiences. So this is an opportunity for us to start a relationship with another global neighbor for Hudson students, similar to what we started with uh, our Thailand uh, friends. And um, we want this experience to come to life for our students and staff and certainly build their excitement and interest in global learning in the future. The cost of this program for the school district is $1,500 because it is supported through grants from the um, China Exchange Initiative. There are a couple additional training trips that I'll need to make to Madison in preparation for my trip. And um, then there will also be some um, travel expenses while Mr. Zhang uh, and activity expenses while he's here. If you have questions, I'd be happy to answer any of us. The questions have to be in Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> Next time, yeah. Remember, can you uh, give me those dates again? When um, is it, Mr. Zhao? Zhao is going to Zhao. I think that's how you say it, Mark. Um, uh, November 14th through the, I said 16th, it's 19th. 14th. And I, I just, I'll just make a, a brief comment. I just think this is a wonderful opportunity for the, for the Hudson District. Um, you know, China is and, and will continue to be a, a major player uh, on the world stage politically and economically. And um, I just think the, the value of these connections just cannot be, cannot be uh, 
the price and everything on it. It's a very valuable uh, relationship, and uh, I think it's wonderful that uh, you're taking the opportunity and representing our district. So. Any other questions, comments, or members? Uh, thank you, Mary, for that report. Certainly a full report and a lot of exciting things going on. So. Um, we'll move on to the SMART goal. Okay. seems like we were just here, <laughs> and part of um, our purpose in August when we were here was presenting the results of our goals. This time, we are going to present what our goals are for this coming school year. And I couldn't help but, um, when I was especially hearing um, to, the, to um, our speakers on Rivercrest talk about this beautiful, beautiful facility that we're in, and I wrote down some of the words. Um, that it took to make this beautiful um, building that, that we're sitting in right now. And some of those words were collaboration, stretching, courage, and excellence. And I couldn't help make the parallel to um, what happens inside each and every one of our eight sites that goes on. Um, those words really, really reflect the work that teachers and all staff do, and in particular, the work that principals do, um, as well as district office in supporting the work that principals and teachers do. So those words definitely apply. They're not tangible necessarily, although we're certainly seeing more results than we ever have before um, um, in ter terms of them being tangible. But um, nonetheless, they um, have a lot of application. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about our focus um, with our administrative leadership team. Every month, uh, we meet um, as a leader leadership community, and that includes all of us, um, Tim and Sandy, as well um, as um, lots of other district office administrators, uh, as well as building principals, including our associate principals. And together, we look at how we, as leaders, are building the capacity within our organization to lead that organization. Um, this, we, we study, um, oftentimes we do um, book studies or we study current research, uh, all around the topic of how to be a leader for learning. And we know that the teacher is the number one um, um, variable where whether kids learn or not, but administrators come right in underneath teachers. And so um, we believe and invest in our administration in becoming these leaders of learning that can go back out to the sites then and support um, the, the building goals. Uh, there's some pieces that are going to be a little bit different and so um, that I want to talk to you about. Uh, we're getting better as we're moving along. And one of the things that, that we're doing this year in terms of setting our SMART goals has to do with thinking about the end target. And so you're going to see some different baselines tonight. Um, you're going to see some different, um, hear a little bit about some different mechanisms for gathering the data. But if you were to think about um, a finish line and think about um, running the race uh, to June 2010, and um, at June, we are going to be at, we want to be at a certain point. The way that we're collecting and reporting our data is how along the way are we making sure that we are measuring to get to that finish line. And so we've shifted a little bit, in, and you'll hear that reflected when uh, the principal speaks. We just wanted you to know about that. Um, so the baselines might look and sound a little bit different than when we presented the results, but that's the reason why. We're learning as we go. We're learning how to let um, our data drive and motivate um, our staff. And um, so that's one of the pieces that's a little bit different. The other piece that's different is we, um, we really are focusing on how can we drill the SMART goal down to the individual student. Now, if you think about that, that's a pretty profound statement. So you're taking a lofty goal such as um, 
um, teaching essential knowledge and skills and assessing those for rate, um, rising, uh, raising literacy levels. And you're trying to drill that down to what's making a difference for the kids that already have it and what's, what are we doing for the kids that don't. How are we moving everyone along the, uh, along the continuum? What we're going to see more in the future is individual grade levels at different sites or departments setting their own goal. And, um, but but we're, that's kind of what our efforts are, are working on. So you're going to see this ongoing measurement of growth, and then it's not only just measuring, but what do we have to monitor and adjust along the way. Uh, the other... Um, the other thing that is a big shift is deeper levels of collaboration. Um, really authentic dialogue about teacher practice, authentic dialogue about kids learning or not. And um, finally, um, just better structures to, um, to report data and examine it along the way. So with that, I'm going to invite um, Principal Ed Lucas up. He's going to be the um, first up to present the high school SMART goals. To start with our baseline for uh, a new SMART goal that we're establishing for this year, uh, we have determined that 17% of all incoming ninth graders are considered at risk of failure. And this goal is in conjunction with our larger SMART goal that we'll be talking about a little bit later of uh, increasing our A's, B's, C's, and D's along the, with the general population. Our new SMART goal for this year for focusing primarily on the ninth graders as one of our segments or one of our individual SMART goals will be to reduce the number of uh, incoming failures by 50%. And so that's a pretty lofty goal. And this is new territory for us. It's uh, going to require us to implement a couple of practices that we have not done before. I think we're ready to go to the next one and to develop the structures and systems that guarantee intervention with our freshmen. And this is the process that, that we will use. We have been working on a number, we've been working on the RTI, Response to Intervention uh, mandate that we have by the state, and uh, we're connecting our work with our ninth graders with the RTI process as well. And that process requires different tiers of interventions, from low-level interventions to very specific interventions of taking individual students and working with them on specific skills. This process, our attainment of this goal requires us to monitor all ninth graders who are at risk on a regular basis using not only our teachers but administrators and counselors as well. And of course, monitoring and adjusting those uh, results of those students uh, that are enrolled in a freshman support group is significant because we have taken our freshmen who are struggling and the counselors have begun working with those individuals on study skills and issues that are causing them to uh, fail or to not be successful. And some of the interventions that they are using are, have proven to be successful and will continue to grow those as well. One of the things that we see with our freshmen coming into the high school for those who struggle is that they are not involved in activities. And we need to somehow get those students involved. We can't mandate it, but we can certainly encourage them. And we are going to use our senior students and our older students in the building to help us with that process by getting them involved. Because all statistics show students who are actively involved in activities at any school level perform much better academically. And one of the, uh, the last uh, intervention that we're going to use is to take a look at a possible advisory system. We're a very large school with 1,658 students and approaching 1,700, and it, it is easy for students to get lost or fall between the cracks. And advisory programs have been proven to be successful in creating smaller learning communities to uh, help bring down the size of the building and help those freshmen be successful. Last spring, we talked about uh, in the number of students taking advanced placement courses, and we increased our 
number of students taking those courses by 86%, and we currently have 197 students taking multiple AP courses, and uh, they're taking 511 different advanced placement courses. Last year, uh, we had an attainment, I believe it was 82% passed those AP courses. Uh, this year, we're shooting for 90% who are taking an AP exam or AP course will also take the exam. There is a significant, uh, there's a significant purpose in taking that exam, and that is so that students uh, attain the readiness for college and understand the rigor that they're going to face in college. And we're also looking at, by 2010, for next spring when we do our registration to increase that number of students who are taking AP courses. Uh, one, once you get toward the top of the scale in terms of making improvements and making gains, when you're in that 80, 90 percent, those gains can be challenging. So we're stretching ourselves to attain some of these goals this next year. With the AP courses, our action plan is to uh, offer tutoring sessions. We're very fortunate at the high school to have a donor who provides tutoring money to help all students at the high school. And so we're extending that not only on the uh, lower end to help those students pre, uh, be successful and not fail courses, but also at the upper end to uh, be successful with passing their AP exams as well. Currently, right now, in our AP USA, US Place, US History AP course, uh, the students are required to attend two outside tutoring sessions. Uh, it's like an extra class period. They're about four hour sessions, and the AP teacher, Mr. Amon, has been very successful with his students in helping them to prepare for the class early on by attending these sessions, and he has seen significant improvement in their test scores as well. All of our AP teachers provide individual tutoring throughout the year uh, at various times. Some of it is individual, some of it is group, and it's, it depends on uh, which students need it and are willing to come forward to, to ask for the help. We also have, are fortunate to have a donor in the community who helps our financially disadvantaged students by providing the funding to pay for their AP exams, and that's significant for those families who are struggling. And lastly, our teachers always encourage and will continue to encourage all students enrolled in AP courses to take the exam and to uh, take other AP courses as well. Students need encouragement, and that is part of the reason why our AP numbers went up this year, because we uh, had a significant push to encourage students to stretch themselves and to take those courses. Our next goal is to, falls in line with the goal that we've uh, attempted for the last three years, and that is to reduce the number of Ds and Fs. But as Peg stated earlier, we've changed our baseline a little bit and looking at it from a little different perspective, and that is to uh, move by June 89.5% of all high school students will receive an A, B, or C as a final grade in all coursework. That's pretty significant for a school district of our size. And we've gained, we've made significant gains over the last two years, but this next gain is going to, next uh, goal is going to be difficult for us and it will be more challenging, but we feel that we have the mechanisms in place and the support in place to, to make that happen. So again, as I said, as we move more toward the, the top of the, get into that 80, 90 percentile, those gains are going to be minimal. We have implemented a ninth grade intervention plan to reduce D's and F's for those at-risk students. That's with our other SMART goal. Uh, the principals will continue to monitor, monitor a systematic teacher-student communication process. Our students, our, pair, our teachers are communicating on a regular basis with us as well as with our counselors as to the status of students. We'll need to gather academic data and provide information to the counselors and connecting that with our RTI or period of interventions to response to interventions, uh, which will be mandated to follow in a few years. We'll continue to develop and utilize the data from common summative assessments in each department 
And when we talk about collaboration at the high school, this is a huge system change in creating common summative assessments to create a viable curriculum for all students so that every student as an example who takes an Algebra 1 course, the content will be the same and delivered to all of those students. So teachers have to be on the same page. They have to collaborate. They have to work together. And the only way to measure that is through a common summative assessment at the end of the semester. That requires a tremendous amount of time uh, from each of those, from the team of teachers putting that together so that they can evaluate that assessment at the end of the semester to see whether it's a valid assessment of what the students have learned. This is a shift, and it's taking us some time to do it because teachers have, for the most part, worked in isolation, and that's the typical model that you see at the high school level. Departments are isolated and teachers work in isolation and our teachers are making uh, great progress toward collaborating and working together, and you'll see some uh, great changes in the near future. And lastly, we'll continue to expand our tutor program uh, to include teacher, teacher tutors during the school day as well as before and after school. We're looking at different structures, uh, much as the elementary did with structuring their planning time, we're looking at restructuring our school day and our study hall times to provide teachers uh, paired up with students who have academic difficulties. As an example, if an English student has difficulty writing or reading, we want to place that student into a study hall uh, with an English teacher. So, those are some of our goals. We're, we're moving, we're stretching, and uh, it'll definitely be a challenge for us. Thank you, Mr. Lucas. Any questions for... Back to the beginning, Ed, um, we have 17% um, of our ninth graders uh, identified as at risk for academic failure. Can you just expand on that just a little bit? Are, are we talking about students that, that, that come here? Um, I mean, I'm just talk, talking purely, purely grades, uh, deficient grades, that, that type of thing. Is it just a little bit more than that? Primarily grades, and it includes students across the continuum, all all eighth graders, all ninth graders coming into the building, and they'll have a variety of. Uh, some of them will have disabilities, and uh, but those are the ones that those are the students who have been identified by the middle school counselors uh, as potential at-risk students. Uh, they may be borderline students, but they may have outside issues that are going that help that uh, lead to some of those at-risk behaviors. Um, and just one one other uh, brief question um, to make sure I understand it correctly. So uh, right now, one of the smart goals that we have, we have 90% of our students uh, in high school, um, A, Bs, and Cs. And, and my understanding, right, we're going to try to boost that up to, to 95% then and cut the Ds and Fs actually in half. We're asking, yes, we are. Okay, that is an ambitious goal. I mean, I, 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 mean, I applaud you for, for, for taking that on. It, and clearly, when you do get into the 90s, I think, as you said, I think you'll be fighting very hard for each percentage. But um, And when you get to that level, you're looking at individual students. Right, right exactly. Well, it's a, a worthwhile goal. Thanks, Ed. If I could clarify the um, students that were coming into ninth grade, um, one of the reasons that we received um, the information from the um, middle school and went with sort of that data as a baseline is when kids make transition to a different level, they're more at risk in terms of um, academic failure based on sometimes transition. So some of the students that were identified for the counselors are by the counselors were kids that they're worried about making that transition um, from the middle school setting to the high school setting. So good, that helps. Me. Oh, and I just I have one more question if I may, Dan. Um, our freshman year initiative. I know that we talked about this a number of years back when we were getting it going. That was a class that was hopefully meant to address some of these issues. Um, and this is maybe kind of an unfair question, but I'll ask you, is there, is there some thoughts of looking at that class uh, differently, restructuring it differently, changing what how that is offered to sort of, sort of work with this 17%? 
Yes, we are. We're the freshman year initiative class, and the counselors are working with us in this in this goal because they they work with those students individually in the classroom right now. And part of that intervention that, or part of the success of the program is, the counselors have gotten to know all of their students. And in the past, with uh, having one grade level, it was impossible for a counselor to know 400 students. And now by dividing it up, uh, sharing those each grade level uh, with the counselors, they know their students and they know them well. And so it was very easy for them to pull out those students who needed a support group. They know right now which ones are beginning to struggle, and they are putting those students together into that support group so they work with them and uh, provide intervention strategies to help them be successful. Uh, we do have uh, the data from the FYI courses in terms of how successful that course has been and the benefits that it has provided, and I can provide that for you sometime. It's been very, very positive from a student perspective and how much it has helped them to make the transition. And as we changed our model with the FYI, we are now offering that to all freshmen either during the summer or the first semester of the school year. And that's made a big difference as well. So we, we get those students at the beginning uh, when they enter high school. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lucas and Mr. Cope will present the middle school. Goals. I'm glad you clarified the criteria by which you came up with 17%. Um, we have a tendency to want to over-identify rather than under-identify in those transitional phases. Um, the, uh, first of all, with our SMART goal for uh, the upcoming year, uh, one of the things that I think I mentioned to uh, the board once before is that we've entered into a process whereby we're kind of shifting our focus and our SMART goals you know, from year to year, and this is one of the first sort of turns uh, you know, in that direction. Uh, and the work that we're going to do this year will create the baseline uh, that we'll be using in the future. But the 910 SMART goal is that by um, June, 85% uh, of all of our students uh, will score at the 100% level on identified essential knowledge and skills on all the common summative unit assessments. And yes, I did say 100%. Uh, that is um, important for us that, that we acknowledge that all kids um, have an opportunity. Uh, and that when they uh, are presented with essential knowledge and skills, that it's 100% of those essential knowledge and skills that they need. Uh, we've chosen to use as our, hopefully our baseline, that will be 85% of all of our students who will get 100% uh, of the essential knowledge and skills that have been identified. Uh, and we're able to do this work largely because we created common summative assessments for every unit of instruction um, uh, in our building uh, over the course uh, of the past year. And uh, that's how we can, uh, I think, move toward you know, this particular goal. Uh, the key actions uh, will identify essential knowledge and skills within each unit, which um, we, are, we have done and we continue to refine as we become more aware of things such as the 21st century skills framework and uh, things of that nature. We continue to adjust and, and modify a little bit uh, what is deemed essential. Uh, determine grading and reporting system uh, questions uh, that we've identified. Uh, that will be uh, a challenge because that potentially moves us away from some of the uh, more traditional uh, approaches to uh, grading and reporting. Uh, record student success and failure on essential knowledge and skills, gather and organize and disaggregate the data. To meet weekly as grade level teams to examine the common assessment data and student work. You know, we've been doing that over the past year. Uh, that has just been a tremendous uh, asset to us. Um, and both the, um, the conversation, the discussion that we've been having uh, amongst our teachers uh, and the, we think the successes of our students are having. And then obviously monitor and adjust the instruction uh, for the upcoming units uh, as well as monitoring and adjusting and making the changes for the next year when those units roll around again. Is that the end peg? Thanks, Mr. Thank you. Thank you. The elementary uh, principals, as you recall, um, uh, are submitting a um, elementary 
district goal, and so, but they each do have a part in, in discussing um, the goal and the actions. Good evening. I think you'll see a little continuation on the theme that has been um, started back from the Hoffman group when they presented. You'll see some talk about the courage and the collaboration, the conviction that it takes to do exactly what we're doing. Um, as elementary principals, we're excited to continue this process. We're going to continue to be focusing on our readers. And you can see the baseline up there. I think it bears a little bit of explanation. You can see this is 31% of all of our 1 through 5 learners are reading at or above grade level on their spring targets. Um, some changes in there that I think everyone needs to understand. First of all, that number might seem surprisingly low because if you remember last year we reported that 79% of our students collectively were reading at or above grade level as measured by the f and the DRA. This is a little bit different way of looking at it, and Peg alluded to it, and I, and I think that it's, it's been talked about a few times this evening, but we're going to be looking at our year-end target, and this will allow us to really look at a growth model and will really um, pay, pay um, tribute to all of our learners all the way along the spectrum. So right now, according to those year-end targets, 31% of our students are at or above grade level. Our goal that we set collaboratively was that uh, by June of 2010, 83% of all our K-5 learners will be reading at or above grade level as measured by the DRA, f &P on their spring targets. And with that continuation of the theme, it will take, um, it took courage to come up with our goal and it will take conviction from all of us administratively and all of our teachers definitely to reach that goal. Thank you. I'm excited to share some of our key actions that we're doing as an elementary division. About a year ago, we principals have begun um, investigating and researching interventions or ways we can help all of our students succeed. And we are beginning this year, and actually we've begun for um, a lot of our grade levels, something that we call target time. And target time is an acronym that's, it, that stands for Teams Achieving Goals and Expectations Together. Again, it's that collaborative spirit that we're working together to help all of our students students achieve. What this is is 30 days or 30 minutes, excuse me, is built into every grade level schedule and a team of educators come into that grade level and help students with remediation or acceleration so that we can help all kids grow. We're really looking at that growth model for all of our kids. When I say a team, I mean not just our reading specialists and our reading assistants. We have our classroom teachers involved in this as well. We have our GT, our special um, educators work at that time, and we have parent volunteers that are working with our students here. So it's a systematic time, 30 minutes, where we're reaching all of our kids' internet, our individual needs. Um, during this time, for our students that are below grade level or at risk of being below grade level, we have developed a research-based intervention lesson with the reading specialists, with our literacy coaches, so it's a systematic way of intervening with these students. Also, some other benefits is because it's 30 minutes, these kids are not missing other subject areas, which we find is a, is a great thing as well. Um, some other things that we have is we're able to meet a lot of students. At Hudson Prairie, we can meet 30 to 40 students in one half hour in a grade level during this time, and we use a push-in model so kids aren't feeling different. All kids are involved in this work to help with their remediation and acceleration. And also, we have the most highly qualified people, our teachers, that are helping with these intervention strategies. So we're very proud as a principal team and a team with all of our literacy facilitators and reading specialists working on that target time intervention block. Um, another key action, because we have this target time intervention block, we are able to provide more balanced instruction to all of our readers. So during readers' workshop, when we're doing guided reading, we're able to meet the needs of all students on a regular basis. Um, so we are both um, accelerating students, and we are both remediating students and meeting students at their own level. So we are very proud of those two actions. Thank you. Hi, earlier this evening, Mary talked about our common planning time, and it's, it's one of the two structures, the other was the target time, that we've really had to change as we move forward um, with the work that we want to do with students. So it took a lot of work to come up with a plan that didn't cost the district any money. Uh, a, lot, a lot of hours were put into it, but to be able to come to uh, 
a plan that was able to allow us to have 45 minutes each day for every classroom teacher grade K through fifth to meet. So, for example, in my building, from 2.50 to 3.35 each day, third grade teachers are available to meet with each other. Um, so that was really, really an important thing to do. We didn't have that before in the system. So we talked about something that we needed to allow teachers to be able to collaborate. Um, when we came and talked to you in August, and we talked about individual successes that we're having in our buildings, and we mentioned department successes, grade level successes. But the piece that we could trace that back to was the collaboration that was taking place. Now, at the time, we didn't have the structure in place to have a really high level of collaboration in Albert with grade levels. This common planning time will allow us to do that. Now, as administrators, intuitively, we knew how important that was. But um, this past summer, um, many administrators you know, the elementary team, along with some teachers, went to hear Doug Rees, who's nationally renowned as far as um, school improvement not only as a speaker, as a researcher, but he would, he talked about what is the biggest influence on moving teacher practice forward. And, and it's not their undergraduate degree, it's not, you know, their, their um, professional reading that they're doing, it's not even once they're teaching their graduate degree, but the thing that moves their practice forward the most was the advice that they got from colleagues. And so we look at now having that available for staff to be able to sit down, to be able to to work with, with each other and to kind of solve problems with, with students and their learning. We're really excited about that. I wanted to give you an example of how we're using that common planning time. So teachers now have, you know, that day six, I mean, excuse me, they have 45 minutes each day available, but on day six we really have structured it because we know some, some staff aren't used to that collaborative piece yet, and so we have protocols that we're using, and one that we used this fall was to allow them to actually administer one of our reading assessments together with one student. When that student was done, obviously that student went to music or art or phi ed, and they didn't stay for the discussion. But then using the protocol, the teachers were able to ask, okay, were we consistent in giving that assessment? What did we do that was similar? What did we do that was different? And if I was that student's teacher, what information would I take from this assessment to drive their instruction? What would be my next step with that child? Led to some really, really deep conversations, and then they were able to say, okay, I, you know, I feel pretty good with how I'm giving this assessment. I'm pulling the right information from it. I know what to do with it next. So that's one example of how we're using our day six collaboration time. So right now we're, we're taking the day six, and that's one that we're structuring, but what we're finding is they're using those other days. They have time to pop in, ask questions, talk about curriculum. So that's really exciting. Um, I wanted to end with one thing as far as some reading that I had done about this collaboration piece, and it, it's the idea that we have many veteran teachers and in the past, they benefited their classrooms. But other teachers didn't get to benefit if they're not having these conversations with their expertise and knowledge. So when they, when they leave, that's gone. This collaboration time lets us take advantage of that. Now the flip side is, these veteran teachers also get to hear from newer teachers that may have new ideas or innovative ideas that they would, would not have thought of. So that's some of the pieces that we're really excited about now having the structure in place 45 minutes a day for teachers to collaborate. Delph provided you with a really great example of using data in that common planning time. In order to help teachers focus their discussion during that common planning time, we knew as a team we needed to get the data together in a way that was efficient and timely and visual for teachers to use. I'm going to share with you three examples of how we're working on that, and it's still in process. The first one is our kindergarten team of teachers. Um, six of them are individuals that I work with on the assessment team, designed and developed sort of a baseline assessment to, of the essentials that they thought they needed to know about an incoming kindergartner in order to help them be successful through kindergarten and starting first grade. They talked to first grade teachers and looked at some of the older assessments they had done and then implemented a couple of new ones. In compiling the data this September, we discovered that for example, nearly 50% of our incoming kindergartners already have an understanding of 11 of the 13 concepts about print. That's a pretty important statistic to know because we had recommended then that we no longer assess that, take the time to assess all that in the beginning, but we incorporate it into our instruction so that we can target the students that really need that attention. That's one example of using data for timely decision making. 
second example is um, due to the efforts of Amy Hamburg and Dave Bramble putting together an Excel spreadsheet with formulas that all of us can use as principles to put together our district-wide data goal, but also to sort in several different ways students' progress and growth. And that color-coded visual chart has been really helpful to us in making our decisions about the goal and also in kind of targeting pockets in our district that need attention, focused attention. A third example is the MAP test. We're seeking additional training so that that, da that data that's available to us through the dynamic reporting suites can be better utilized. It's generally been used to report in Hudson, report growth targets to report whether they would be proficient on a WKCE, but more importantly, the MAP has an instructional sensitivity that we can look at writ bands, specific reading skills and math skills for specific buildings, for the district as a whole, for class grade levels, and for individual students, and help them target areas that are specifically needing instruction and interventions. Another um, system-wide tool that we put in place was an assessment calendar that actually marks all the windows when teachers need to be monitoring progress and giving us that information. And I think it relieves some of the anxiety of the assessments that they're expected to do because they can see it ahead of time and have those windows. We've also um, been looking at increasing rigor at kindergarten while implementing a developmental readers workshop. The, um, kin the elementary principals have been talking about increasing rigor and also um, doing, um, aligning our, um, the reading curriculum more with grades one through five. We did that this fall. We implemented um, an alignment with one through five in our readers workshop format. And the benefits of that include um, an increase in, um, sorry, this is my train of thought. Um, <laughs> um, beginning this year, our, our, it's aligned with our, our one through five readers workshop model. The benefits of this include a common understanding of what is being taught, a common language between teachers, and best of all, the ability for teachers to meet in vertical teams and discuss reading on a K through five continuum. We actually did this last year with our writing through a writer's workshop model and the feedback from first grade teachers this fall was really positive and we're expecting the same thing next year. Thank you. Mary? No baby? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think it's appropriate while we're talking. Okay. I have the last two slides. And it occurred to me, because I'm the last one and listening to everyone else, and if it hasn't occurred to board members, I mean, it's really exciting to me to be up here with my colleagues. It's much easier to have a SMART goal at a middle school where there's one principal. And the first slide said, every student, every classroom, every day. And that's a really difficult task with six elementary schools, and it's very exciting to me, and I hope it is to you, too. But the first one that I'm going to highlight is, is really how we've um, changed the role of our reading specialists. We've changed the role of a lot of people around here, and they might be <laughs> calling you to tell you that, but <laughs> um, our reading specialists are um, gifted in teaching children to read. And they've kind of been this little pocket of, of excellence, and, you know, we had their knowledge and we weren't able to share it um, among the building teachers. Um, as you've heard, the, the time that allows them to bounce in, um, my reading specialist and I have already twice rolled through with our teachers at no cost to the district. Um, we, can, we can sit there all day and talk to the teachers and talk about interventions and talk about the things we can do. And she can share what she knows about um, teaching children to read um, in a very collaborative way. And that's what we're all doing. And it's um, really increased the rigor of our reading specialists across the district. Um, our gifted and talented teachers are also working collaboratively to um, better meet the needs of our high ability students during that intervention time, challenge students with higher reading abilities, but also to um, work with the teacher to provide um, 
resources and higher expectations for our um, students on the high end of the reading abilities. We have two, two things district-wide that we've implemented. Um, our reading specialists are helping with those in all of our buildings. Um, we've beefed up our at-home reading program as well as try to provide resources for those at-home reading books. And we have a literacy connection um, that is actually volunteers as well as um, parents, community members. I heard one principal say high school students come in. They're trained in how to read with the students in a very specific strategy. And they come in um, on a daily or weekly basis as volunteers in our buildings. Um, one of the last things I'll add is the other thing that's exciting in hearing everyone talk about their SMART goals is, is really that we're, we're working, I had to lean over because I'm thinking deficit model is how a lot of our schools have always operated. Where's the deficit and how are we going to fix it? And we're wor really working from assets. We're looking at what we have and what we can do better. And it's, it's a really exciting thing to be up here and sharing it for the first time with all six elementaries, as well as our high school and middle school. So thank you. Um, thank you for letting us share the passion of our work. I think you can hear the passion in principal's voices. And um, it takes the um, all of the administrators and teachers to pull together for our students. Thank you also for supporting our work with a lot of the um, particular initiatives that you've allowed us to have happen. We'll take any questions and comments for elementary at all. Thank you, Peg. Board members, questions? For I do have a couple. Yes, thanks, Dan. Um, one, I guess, just a clarification. Um, make sure I understand this a little slower than most. And when Dave is going through the um, uh, the reading uh, goal. Um, it's, it sounded to me like we we're just kind of framing it a little bit differently, talking about our our um, uh, students now at 31 percent at the spring target now in the fall. And the, the, the spring target will, the reach will be will be the 83 percent. And then last year, uh, overall, we were at, at 79 percent for reading at grade level. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The one thing about the 31%, if you think about a third of our kids are already at their end target, is pretty significantly, and we're seeing that. Um, in our in our other standard our statewide data that supports that all of our kids are moving. So well, I agree. That's great. Um, and, and lastly, just a, just a, uh, a comment on on um, the uh, this is so exciting to see the implementation implementation of the common planning time that, that Dolph had talked about. It, you know, in, in some ways, the work that I do at the city of St. Paul is, is kind of similar. I'm in I'm in the environmental division. We all have sort of various districts. There's about ten of us, but. But I would be lost without my colleagues. I mean, I am so much better at what I do because I can bounce ideas, run you know, feedback uh, with, with, with my colleagues. And, and I know, you know, a lot of teaching does occur in isolation in the classroom. And so, you know, it is, it's a challenge to, as, as Dolph so well stated, you know, to connect with those veteran teachers, those new teachers that have innovative ideas. And so I just think this is just a really exciting move forward. And so I'm glad that you're progressing so well. Thanks. Thank you, Mark. Other board members? Very short of board members. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to be easy. We're going to be easy on you tonight. I, I, Peg, thank you, and, and principals, thank you for for your reports. Uh, I'm, I, I guess what rings through all of these presentations is just sort of the collaboration, not only amongst all of you working together, but also at each individual school, which which is heartening for me to hear that that's going on and, and working together. As Mark pointed out, uh, nobody's an island. So good luck. You know, those are some lofty goals, but uh, I think we can get there.
I would just like to um, point out, and we keep pointing this out, but it's really important for those that are, are watching and listening, as well as for all of us, just to acknowledge that the system for learning that we're creating is an early childhood through 12 system. You can see the connection between our principals and the work that they're doing. It isn't individual school anymore. It's a whole systems approach. And we're even though we're not focusing on the, on the WKCE, we are improving there. We're improving at the top, we're improving at the bottom, and we're improving in the middle because the system is working. And um, the professional development that's occurring, you heard about it, I think Dolph spoke about it, um, is extremely important as you send teams uh, to conferences to hear and to work together to continue to support improvement in our practices with teachers and administrators, teacher leaders as well, and um, the system is working to help improve learning for each and every student at higher levels. So it, it's really, um, this kind of work needs to be really applauded. It's very unusual in a district, and um, I just thank our principals and the teachers that are working to improve our practices and innovate to make the system the best for each student. Thanks, Barry. Thanks again, Patrick. Okay, we'll move on to the proposed budget update. Tim, give us some good news. Um, hmm, I think about that. Um, you know, it's not, it's not all bad with this update. Um, I just want to touch on a few points on uh, page 34 of the board back. And, and one of the things that we're, we're getting numbers unless you get uh, specific questions, um, but we 
week we have you know, certainly a lot of different changes uh, with uh, uh, some of the stimulus reporting and, and the accounting. So there have been some some changes and some adjustments uh, under the EFO 809 unaudited figures, but um, the overall revenue and the overall expenses have not changed in street classification of certain things. Um, so, uh, again, those numbers are, are pretty solid. And moving on to, if we go down to the uh, page 38, uh, we've got uh, total expenditures now for, for 0809 of 49683 um, versus our budget, our 0809 budget of 51436. And then you can see the, the 910 budget. Uh, 49 million 326, which is a uh, 2.1 2.1 million dollar increase over the 0809 budget. Um, interesting to note that if you go back to the 0708 year, uh, the budget is uh, this year's budget is 1.4 percent above the 0708 year, so it's uh, been seen you know, very little very little growth. Um, and uh, that that's about it. I'm, you know, going through this quickly, certainly if you have questions, if you ask. That is, that's, that's the update at this point. Okay, thanks, Tim. Any questions for Tim? Tim, could you just um, remind us again, because we're coming up on having to certify the, the budget, but, you know, we're mid-October right now. Critical. Through that about the which, which part? When we the deadlines in terms of certifying the budget, that's right. We get our meeting uh, October twenty seventh meeting to certify the the levy and the budget. Okay, and uh, that there's a requirement that uh, that all districts have that certified uh, by November first. So we'll be holding our meeting on the twenty seventh to certify. Consent items would include A1 through 4 as well as B, YMC, Secretary Expenditure, Liner 2, Motion for Approval of the Consent Items. And if somebody has expenditures to come in here, uh, Mr. President, move to approve the consent items, including authorizing the Director of Financial Services to be authorized to pay bills in the amount of $2,169,042.65. We have a motion for the plan. We have a second. Second. Second by Barb. Any discussion? Yes. That did include item B. Yes. The, the amount of the expenditure did not include the Camp St. Croix expenditures. That is an additional $4,130.50. Okay, that would be included in the motion, correct? Correct. Okay. So we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, those opposed, motion to approve. We'll move on to the committee reports, learning and program development. Part. <coughs> okay, so the learning and program development committee met um, in September and we had a few things on the agenda, and so bear with me at this point in the future. All right, so the first um, thing that we talked about is online learning. Um, Hudson High School has offered online learning for several years in a couple of um, specific class activities, and we had some discussion around, and Mary mentioned it earlier, um, uh, we see students opting out of the in-school um, uh, opportunity to do online courses, and so there's a, a, a longer-term, more strategic discussion going on around what do we want to do in that arena. Um, 
in the meantime, we continue to explore online offerings as, um, as uh, really a, a way to augment the courses that we're able to offer um, in the high school setting. And in particular, I know Sandy and Principal Lucas are looking at um, places where we see students taking courses at River Falls um, through the youth options, is what it's called, um, and trying to facilitate taking those courses in the high school through an online option. So. Um, the second thing that we talked about as a committee is uh, the National Clearinghouse, and um, we will implement that uh, and begin to use that data this year. What it will allow uh, the administration team to do is to take a look at our graduating uh, our graduated students, um, uh, and through this National Clearinghouse, which is essentially is an enormous data warehouse of um, high school graduates, is to understand what they have done post high school, both in terms of uh, where they might be attending post high school um, schools, as well as what sort of degrees that they have earned. Um, and it's a, of an extraordinarily low-cost option. We do some things on our own right now, uh, but there's some question as to whether we're able to gather all the, all the data that might be relevant as we try and assess really um, how we're moving um, in terms of our goal of uh, having all students attend post high school uh, education. The third thing that we talked about uh, briefly was the smart goals and just, uh, we talked about how the Sparkle presentation would work tonight. We've already seen that. And then the last thing, um, there was um, uh, Principal Mitchell came, uh, joined us and talked a little bit about the, the, the new teacher mentoring program. And one of the things that um, they highlighted was that um, in a new teacher mentoring scenario, it's really not year one that's the, the defining um, criteria, but actually year two, so there's a heightened focus this year on having a second year of formal mentoring with an existing educator in the district um, as, a, as a differentiator and a way to really retain, uh, attract and retain uh, talented educators in the district. That is our reporting question. Thank you. Thanks for the many questions for that. If not, uh, thank you. We'll move on to finance committee. Thanks, Smith. On uh, September 28th, uh, first item was just closed session to talk about uh, negotiations with uh, the union groups. Um, the second was uh, reviewing some of the uh, budget information for 09 and 10, including certification. Um, to already cover that. And then was how we allocate more kind of a, how we allocate some expenses for the after school care. So. Okay, well, thanks for any questions. Okay, we'll move on to Governance and Policy Committee. That's my committee. And we also had a closed session item having to do with uh, considering the educational record of a specific student. And then we um, looked at some policies, um, some proposed new policies which were approved tonight. And those policies emanated out of a civil rights audit by DCI. That's what motivated many of the changes that, that took place. Um, we talked briefly about our upcoming board work session that's the end of this month. And uh, we're going to be working with WASB with that session. It's going to be a um, Saturday morning session um, of the board. And then a school crossing guard resolution that uh, we talked about briefly, but it will be coming back to the board for uh, consideration in November. So, um, any questions? Uh, Mark, personnel and negotiations committee. Um, thanks, Dan. Yes, the uh, personnel committee met last week. A uh, pretty short agenda. Basically, um, yes, this week uh, went through the uh, 08 to 09 uh, comparison to 09 10 uh, staff. And um, really, they, I think, did, a, did an excellent job, as um, Mary had stated, we're up over, over 90 um, students this year, and uh, we've added um, just very slightly under uh, three uh, FTEs, um, so basically, um, you know, enrollment-driven enrollment -driven growth, um, and uh, no change whatsoever in, in uh, administrative positions. So, um, 
three more AFT meetings for this school year. Um, and then followed uh, with the closed session uh, for the purpose of uh, deliberating for negotiations for all our various student groups. Thanks, Mark. Any questions for Mark? If not, uh, Mary's going to tackle the facilities and grounds committee meeting in the towns that passes. Right. And then, uh, committee members, feel free to uh, chime in. We had a closed session for the purpose of deliberating about sale and purchase of public properties, and then we spent the, uh, quite a bit of time during the meeting talking about um, Holton Elementary School challenge that we have and long-term options uh, for that challenge and consideration. And uh, if you will remember, uh, this year we looked at both kindergarten and fifth grade. Our numbers in each of those um, grade levels were a challenge for us whether we should have one or two sections. We eventually moved to two sections of both uh, grade levels, but we are underutilizing uh, the space for learning in the building in that um, we are oftentimes on the either low end of our uh, class size guidelines or underneath our class size guidelines in um, most of those grade levels. And so as we um, as, as parents came before us from Holton, we assured them that we would uh, address a long-term solution after we got through um, making decisions about kindergarten and fifth grade this year. And so we started that conversation with facilities and grounds. We talked about four um, different options, um, staying the same, uh, boundary change, um, looking at program op options or um, attracting students from other Hudson schools or students outside of our district. Uh, the, the committee um, agreed with the recommendation that for the next year we'll stay the same in how we um, staff the building. So we'll go through the same process we have in the past. Uh, we will be keeping track of the um, enrollments of neighboring schools that have touched the boundaries of Holton. And we'll also um, consider and investigate or research um, some uh, program options, such as multi-age. Now, because of the timing and the goals for this year, that's very difficult for us to do um, at the present time. So that's a long-term goal that we'll be looking at in the future and probably picking that up again this summer or um, for the start of the school year. And I'll be moving into Learning and Program Development Committee to guide that work. So that will be um, to come in the future, and um, we'll have more conversation about that. We also had on the agenda the um, American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. Uh, which is stimulus funds for construction. Nope, I didn't say that right, Tim. You're going to. Uh, no, I was going to say we did. We. No, I was going to say we didn't do well, that. Did I was just going to say what it was that we put it on. So I said it right. Oh, good. Okay, so we put it on hold and tabled it to the next meeting because we spent quite a bit of time on the Holton um, situation and, and our challenge there with enrollments. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Mary? If not, Diane, do we have any requests for citizens? No. Then we'll move on to the last agenda item, which is during the closed session pursuant to Wisconsin statutes 19.85, parent one, parent for the purpose of delivering to prepare for negotiations for all union employee groups and the purpose of deliberating about the sale and annual purchase of public properties. And there can be a motion for it. So moved. We have a motion by Mark. Second by Barb, by the roll call vote. Family and I. Middle line. Kaiser shot I. Turn it on. Thank you.